chapter 7, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And we'll be noting this passage in uh, uh, just a few minutes, but um, as you know, we continue to study the book of uh, Luke chapter 17, specifically is what we're in, where our Lord is giving various signs in regard to his second coming. And here we're seeing the fifth sign that he says it will be like the days of Lot. And in that, we're studying the storyline of Lot, what that means to be in the days of Lot. We've seen the New Testament. We've noted in Genesis chapter 19 uh, the uh, storyline of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And we see why our Lord chose to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And because of the rampant sin that was in their heart and in their soul, and the sin that they had was uh, uh, dominated by the sin of sexual immorality, which we know as homosexuality as well. And there we saw the storyline of the men of the city wanting and demanding ultimately for the two men that came and uh, uh, sought refuge or were given refuge in Lot's home that night. Again, who were two angels? How the men of the city of Sodom and Gomorrah demanded that they have sexual relationship with them. And as a result of the rampant sin that was going on and none being found righteous other than Lot and his family, God then destroyed the five cities, as we know, Sodom and Gomorrah and the three other cities that went along with it, and totally wiped them out through fire and brimstone, where Lot and his, his uh, daughters were saved from it. His wife had the potential for being saved, but as you know, and we'll see uh, as we come back to this next week, how the wife turned back and looked back to the uh, city that she was uh, fleeing from, and there was turned into a, uh, a pillar of salt. But here we see a map on the board at the bottom of the Dead Sea, as we call it today, the Salt Sea uh, in, uh, back in the day as well. And as you know anything about the Dead Sea, it's uh, so much salt in it and buoyancy in it that ultimately uh, plant life and animal life, fish life, cannot live in that place. And if you go and try to float there, you can float very easily. It's the easiest place to float in the world, as it were. So in any case, it is uh, very much salt uh, content there, as we understand. And the southern part of that Dead Sea, Sea is where Sodom and Gomorrah and the other three cities states were and now they are all destroyed. So as we understood in Genesis 19 we have the storyline of Lot which is really part of the storyline of Abraham as Lot was Abraham's nephew. But then specifically in verses uh, nine, in, in uh, chapter 18 verse 20 and then in chapter 19 verse 13 we understand that the sin of the city was crying out and God heard the sin. In other words, he was grieved by the sin that was being committed in these five cities. It was exceedingly grave, as it says in these passages, and then ultimately we know it wasn't just the one sin of homosexuality that they had in their life. They were rampant with all kinds of sins, but the homosexuality was that one overt sin that was predominant within their cities that ultimately uh, demonstrated the sinful heart within their soul, and as a result, then God destroyed them and again no believers in that place other than Lot and his family as we understand and therefore God destroyed the entire area in those cities being a demonstration of uh, how God works against sin and how he brings judgment against sin both in time and then in the eternal state as well. So the exceedingly grave sin that they had is told to us in Genesis chapter 19 verse 5. As I said and gave you the storyline where the men of the city both old uh, and young came to Lot's door and demanded that they have sexual relationship with the two men that were in Lot's house that, uh, uh, that he was giving refuge uh, for them that night. And they were those two angelic creatures that took on that form of humanity that came to warn Lot about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and the other cities as well. And they came to warn Lot, and they uh, then were invited into Lot's home. And as a result of the men of the city finding out about new blood, new flesh being in the, s in, in the city, they wanted to have sexual relationships with them. So that's the backdrop that we've seen and understood. Uh, but now we're getting into some principles, which we began on Thursday night of this past week, in regard to right sexual relationships as designed by God. And then we're also going to see wrong sexual relationships according 
to the Word of God. And it's not up to man to decide what is right and wrong in regard to the sexual relationship and really all things in life. It's up to God to decide what is right and wrong because He is our Creator and ultimately He is our Savior as well. So as I've noted, there are two categories of types of sex that operate in human history. And the two categories of sex that we have are plain and simple. The first is legitimate sexual relationship, which is, again, invented by God, which was designed, as we started to speak about on Thursday night, as a form of protection and freedom and privacy and great intimacy and the representation of love within the human race. But it is to be done between one man and one woman, as we'll see in just a minute. And we call this the invisible walls of protection inside the marriage relationship. And again, a legitimate sexual relationship is also uh, for a one man and one woman coming together who are married. Illegitimate sex, then, is defined for us in the Bible as any sinful or evil distortion of what God has defined and what God has graciously provided for the human race. And when we come back on uh, Tuesday of this week, we're going to get into the illegitimate aspects of sexual relationships, and we'll get into some definition of that on Tuesday night so you can understand that in more detail uh, and then recognize it. Uh, but ultimately, we're going to be talking about the right sexual relationship that God has designed for mankind this morning. And that is what we call legitimate sexual relationship between a husband and a wife. Again, an adult male and an adult female. In our day and age, we even have to add that adult aspect to it because, again, an adult should not be having uh, sexual relationships with minors as we understand that and recognize it from Scripture. And that's what we call pedophilia today, which, again, is uh, somewhat rampant in our society today as well. And so, again, it's something that we need to uh, be aware of and ultimately a, a fight against as well so that that does not happen within our society as best as we possibly can have. But in any case, legitimate sexual relationship is between a husband and wife inside the marriage unit as defined for us all the way back in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 2 verse 24. Jesus Christ spoke about this in Matthew and the Gospels of Mark as well. And then we see also Paul reiterating this for us in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 31 and the right relationship of one man, one woman coming together in the beautiful design that God has given to us of right sexual relationship. And so as we understand and uh, recognize the legitimate aspect of uh, sexual relationship that we should be having within our lives, if we are married, then ultimately we understand the wonderful expression that God has given to us. This is part of the protection, the privacy, the freedom that God has created for the human race. It is also a great expression of love between the husband and wife, a form and sense of unity, because those are the only two who are to engage in this type of relationship with each other. And so again, it creates a bond and a unity between them that no one else has a part of. And no one else should have a part of. And it gives them a uniqueness and a strength as well as we see and understand and have defined a little bit already. And we'll see more as we get into this a little bit further. And remember, this is not Jim saying these things. This is God saying these things. God our creator. God our savior. God who is the all sovereign. Who is absolute righteous and just and holy. He's absolute correct and absolute right. And he's absolute love as well. So again, he is the one who has created these things. And he is the one that recognized what absolute goodness is compared to sin within our lives. And he's given us those definitions and understanding so that we too can recognize those things and do our best to say no to the temptation of sin and entering into it and instead say yes to the things of righteousness and goodness and holiness and walk in the will and plan in God and walk in our own righteousness and holiness. And God also knows that when we do that, we walk in his righteousness and the things that are good and correct, we will have peace within our soul. We will have holiness and righteousness within our soul. We'll have happiness and joy within our soul. But as soon as we step outside of that, of that envelope of holiness and righteousness and step inside of sin, 
we know that things are going to be negative within our soul. It's going to be agita within the soul. It's going to uh, create other problems within our lives and give us difficulty and ultimately a, a, a mentality of the soul that is not at peace and at rest. You see, God gives us these things so that we can be at peace and at rest and have great joy and happiness and comfort in life. But when we step inside of sin, all of that is gone and we get the complete opposite of that within our lives. So God designed what we call this sexual relationship to be a castle-like uh, a structure. And this is, again, an analogy that I'm borrowing from Colonel, the late Colonel R.B. Thiem, Jr. And ultimately, d- uh, uh, th- uh, he categorized this union coming together as castle walls. And again, if you think of a castle, it's a fortified structure that is to protect those who are on the inside so that those who are on the outside that are trying to come in and perpetrate some kind of evil or hurt or pain cannot do it. And so the structures of the castle are put up. The walls of the castle are put up so that, again, those who are inside can be protected and keep the evil that is outside, keep it outside. So ultimately, when we understand this, the sexual relationship between a husband and wife are the castle walls that isolate them from the others of society and other persons that may want to you know, disrupt that or hurt that or bring problem to that or even try to satisfy their own sin natures, lust patterns, and ultimately uh, perpetrate that on someone else. But yet when we have this right union put together and in place, and we uh, abide by that on a consistent basis. We put the walls up and the structure is there so that ultimately we are defended from those who would want to harm us in some different way or some who would want to bring evil into our lives. And instead, we remain in what? Virtue and happiness as we honor divine institution number two called marriage. And as you understand, sex always portrays the beauty of interdependence within the marriage unit. And remember, the two have become one. They've become one flesh. And as we know, two brains or two heads are better than one, as we say, within society. Well, that's what God designed between the husband and wife for the two of them to come together and to share in this type of intimacy, which gives them great blessing inside of their marriage and great beauty as well. And it's a beautiful uh, 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 demonstration. It's a beautiful expression of the love and interdependence that those two individuals have one for the other. And it's a great representation. Remember, the marriage is all about a a representation of our relationship with God. As Jesus Christ is our husband and we are his, uh, his bride to be his wife in the eternal state. This is a great representation of that in the earthly realm. As God wants us to be dependent upon his word and his will operating in our life and applying his grace policy. This too, the sexual relationship between a husband and wife in this type of union demonstrates that as well. The interdependence one to the other, just as we are dependent on the word of God to function and operate in the spiritual realm and in our daily lives each and every day. And as we understand that when we uh, 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 get in, uh, into that sexual relationship inside of our marriage, it's like we're going back to the Garden of Eden. And as I said uh, this week, remember in the Garden of Eden, they were absolutely naked and they didn't care. OK, you know, and, and then when sin entered into the world, they tried to cover themselves up. And Jesus said, who told you you were naked? You know, before it was a fine thing. It was wonderful. You had a great expression. Well, when we enter into the sexual relationship uh, with our husband or with our wife, ultimately, you've got to take your clothes off, right? So you're naked once again in that process. It's like going back to the Garden of Eden. But at the same time, it's a coalescence, as we understand, a coalescence of two souls who should be going forward in the plan of God and have that uh, great relationship one with the other, where two souls that are now independent come together in a physical type of way and express what is actually going on within their souls. That's what the right sexual relationship between a husband and wife is all about. The coalescence of bodies demonstrating the coalescence of souls inside the marriage unit. And again, as we go forward in a Christian family, that coalescence of soul is also with the base and foundation of a relationship with our Lord and Savior, 
Jesus Christ. And as I said, I need a vacation. And I just had a vacation, okay? But, you know, we can have a vacation any day we want when we enter into sexual relationship with our husband and with our wife. Because that's another way that we can think about this. You see, it's a vacation from the main laws that are related to the marriage uh, unit and to the marriage uh, 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 function, I guess. I'll, I'll stick with unit. That's probably a better way to say it. That God has designed. You see, inside the marriage, there is a, a order of authority. The husband is the authority over the wife. And that's how God designed the marriage. And that's how he designed it within uh, the human race. And at the same time, the wife is to be obedient and to respect her husband. And that's why it says, in, even in the New Testament, husbands love your wives as Christ has loved you. And then it says for the wife, it says, wives respect your husbands. In other words, they have an obedience to their husbands as the authority that God has designed for them. And that doesn't mean that the husband goes out and abuses the authority and acts as a dictator. That's not what this means at all. It ultimately, it's a give and take process, and it's a working together as two heads are better than one. And for those of you who are in a marriage relationship, you probably understand that, you know, sometimes you're going off like this morning or was it? Uh, no, yesterday uh, we were heading off, coming to the ceremony for my father, the memorial ceremony. And I've got my bags and I got my suit on and I'm packed up. I got my Bible, got my notes, got my computer and I'm heading out the door. And she said, hey, wait a minute. Didn't you remember? Uh, did you remember to bring the plaque to, uh, you know, put up on the wall for the ceremony of your for your father? And I said, Oh, no, I forgot. <laughs> okay. Actually, this was Friday when we came to prepare the room. So in any case, you know, I'm coming down. We we're going to, you know, uh, uh, take the tables out and just have chairs set up for the ceremony on, on Saturday. Uh, as Steve and uh, Barry met me here on Friday to set the room up. And I'm heading out the door and I'm ready to go. I got my toolbox. I got everything I need. Did you remember to bring the plaque? No, I did not. <laughs> okay. Let me go back and get it. Okay. So again, two heads are better than one. But if I was just a dictator, I'd be, and she was like, did you remember? As a dictator, I'd say, shut up. What are you talking about? I'm going to do my own thing. You know? And unfortunately, some men get that way with their wives. And again, that's not how we should operate as men uh, in our marriage relationship. Again, the two heads are better than one. It's a, a great to have the coalescence of souls where you're going forward in life with the same types of likes and dislikes and ultimately going forward as you're going to live your lives together. But, uh, you know, it's not a dictatorship, but yet the husband should have the final say in the decision-making process inside the marriage unit. Now, this is a whole doctrine for another day. I just had to give you some brief there to kind of set this up as to what we're talking about in regard to sexual relationship. But the man has the authority over the woman, but yet when they have the sexual relationship, that authority is set aside. In other words, the husband doesn't dictate what happens in the bed every night, okay? It's up to the wife to decide what she wants to do and what she may uh, uh, want to initiate in that process as well. So he's not the sole dictator in that process and say, okay, you're going to do this and you're going to do that. No, he gets to take a vacation from that. And that's a great thing. You know, as a husband, and I'm one, you know, when we have the responsibilities to make decision after decision after decision after decision, it's kind of nice sometimes when you don't have to make the decision. And again, God has given us this process inside the sexual relationship that the man doesn't have to make the decisions all the time. And sometimes it's a vacation when he doesn't have to make the decision. You know, he doesn't have to decide when we're going to do it, how we're going to do it, where we're going to do it, and all that stuff. I know this is getting a little R-rated here right now, okay? But you have to get kind of talk about these things, all right? But in any case, it's kind of a vacation. It's kind of nice when you don't have to make all the decisions. And oh, by the way, it's kind of nice for the wife to initiate the sexual relationship back to you because now it's like, oh, I guess she does like me after all, okay? Because <laughs> I don't have to initiate everything, okay? Maybe she does like me after all, all right? But in any case, uh, you know, that's what this point is all about. It's kind of a vacation. You see, the husband has the authority over the wife, you know, in the marriage relationship, not as a dictator, but as a good, wise, uh, and just man. 
But inside the sexual relationship, it doesn't have to be that way. And he can take a vacation from his authority, and the woman can take a, you know, a vacation as well. You see, as the woman is to be obedient in the man inside of the marriage relationship, and uh, again, respect the authority and the responsibility that he has in the relationship, again, in the sexual relationship, or we could say in the bed, she doesn't have to be obedient. She can now initiate and should initiate in that process. And, you know, rub his back for a half hour rather than him rubbing her back for a half hour or whatever the case. I saw that once on TV just as a joke. But, you know, in, in any case. But, in a, you know, she can initiate just as much as he can initiate. All right? So when we get into the sexual relationship, it's a vacation from the laws of the divine establishment principle inside of marriage with the authority and the obedience uh, ultimately is out the window. Now it's just an open, free, and relationship in that process. And again, take that vacation. Have fun with it. Enjoy it. God has designed it as a great expression. It's also a great release for both of them. With all the details of life and the problems and the difficulties that we have to face each and every day, when you get into that process and have that sexual relationship, it's a vacation. It's going back to the Garden of Eden. And everything else is absolutely gone. And, you know, without getting into, uh, you know, a whole lot of detail with all of this stuff, this is kind of a tough subject to teach on sometimes, okay? You've got to kind of walk the line as you go through it. But when you're in the, in the bed and in the sexual relationship, it's almost like, you know, your bed has now created walls all around it. There's like an invisible shield around that process. And it's like nothing else is going on around you for that time. And it's a great time of enjoyment that we should be having with our right man and with our right woman. And each spouse has the authority over the other, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 7 in verses 1 through 5. So let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And in verses 1 through 5. <coughs> and again, Paul had to teach this uh, to the Corinthian church because they were... You know, there, there was a lot of kind of sexual immorality going on in and around that church. So he had to teach on these things, reprimanded them, but then also giving them the uh, right information as to how they should treat these things. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, it says, Now concerning the things about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. And again, this is outside the marriage relationship. It says, But because of immoralities... Now, that word in the Greek for immoralities is really a catch-all word for all types of sexual immorality. That's what it's specifically for. Not just, you know, other types of sins like, you know, say drug abuse or drunkenness or something like that. But this is specifically sexual immoralities, all right? But because of immoralities, let each man have his own wife and each woman have her own husband okay so again one husband one wife coming together and let them have each other as it were it says let the husband fulfill his duty to his wife and likewise also the wife to her husband and this is again the sexual relationship that we are to have and it's a duty you think about that too it's a little bit of a duty that we all have to enter into the garden of eden and have this vacation to express the relationship in a fantastic way that continues to be a demonstration of our relationship with God. Now in verse 4 it says, The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise also the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Stop depriving one another except for agreement, for a time, that you may devote yourself to prayer. And come together again, lest Satan tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So again, there can be times where the two of you come together and say, all right, let's have a pause, let's not have sexual relationship for a period of time, whatever that may be. And I would recommend a short period of time, as it says at the bottom half, lest sa Satan tempt you. And again, the lustful temptation of the old sin nature comes. And again, because you're in this pause period, you go and uh, wander off and think about doing something else. But in any case, there can be a pause in that. But otherwise, again, the husband has respons uh, authority. The wife has respons uh, authority over each other's bodies. In, th in other words, both can initiate the sexual relationship. And again, as it says, don't deprive one another. Because this is a great thing. 
Again, it's a great release. It's a great uh, uh, time to you know, get away from all the uh, agita and the details and problems and difficulties of life. It's a great time of vacation, as it were. Again, where the mind gets freed up, the soul gets freed up. And again, you can have a, a, a reinvigoration of the peace and joy and happiness in life. And many times you might even be having a problem with your husband and wife, but then you enter into freely the sexual relationship, and then all of a sudden all those things go away. And now the things that were such a problem aren't a problem any longer. Again, God has designed this in a fantastic way so that, again, there's a lot of benefits inside the marriage and inside of human society as a result. All right, so then we also understand that, uh, as I've already said, again, each can initiate in that, and the other should respond to the initiation in a positive way. And again, not in a negative way. And remember, in all situations, we don't abuse these things either. And sometimes you can say, well, I'm initiating, you should respond right away, okay? But that's an abuse, that's a dictatorship, okay? You see, we need to use wisdom and understanding in this, and we need to use love as well. And again, men and women sometimes are very different. Some men, it's just about physicality. We're women, it's more about emotionality. So we have to understand that about each other and then respond appropriately and help each other with the emotionality or the physicality based on the, you know, the, the mode of operation of the individual. And do it wisely. And when you do, you'll find that ultimately you'll get a greater response from the other spouse if you understand their mode of operation. And so again, that's what we should be doing and not being dictators in the process and abusing the situation, but ultimately doing it wisely, doing it with the word of God, with the mind of Christ. But ultimately we can initiate, we can throw off the normal boundaries of the husband-wife relationship and just have a great time because that's what God wants us to do. This is what we ought to do in the legitimate sexual uh, relationship that God has designed. And as we've noted and understand uh, that when we enter into that, it gives us a great opportunity of intimacy like never before. And it's a unique one between you and your wife. Again, you can have intimate relationship with other people, which means closeness, hugging, kissing, you know, your kids, your grandkids, whatever the case may be, and uh, friends and family. But the sexual relationship that we're talking about is a unique intimacy that is designed for the husband and wife only and only uh, between the two of them. And when we enter into that in an appropriate way, it's the most fantastic thing that God can give to us in life. And it, and it gives us a fantastic relationship as the walls come up and ultimately we enter into this great relationship that is unique between us and our wife that nobody else needs to know about, nobody else has to be involved in as well or should be involved in as well. Again, either by talk or by action. Again, this is unique between those two individuals. And again, hold it in that high regard of the uniqueness. Hold it in the high regard of God's design and blessing for you and your husband or wife in that situation. So again, it's unique uh, between men and women. But on the other hand, illegitimate sex is man's sinful evil and distortion of God's grace policy and design that he's given to the human race. And this is why we see in the days of Noah, God wiped out the earth uh, with the flood. Why? Because the angels came down. And with their sinful, evil distortion, they distorted what the sexual relationship between a husband and wife, as they destroyed the marriage unit as well. They came down and completely destroyed it. So what did God do? He had to wipe them all out. Get rid of these individuals because, again, the sin and evil became so rampant within their hearts and in within their souls. And so God wiped them out and started all over again. In Sodom and Gomorrah, we see homosexuality and lesbianism that was rampant within their society that destroyed also the marriage unit and God's design of right sexual relationship. And the homosexuality and lesbianism was ultimately a demonstration of the sin nature being absolutely in control of their soul. And it's interesting that there can be societies where there are a lot of unbelievers in their society, but yet if there's a moral code of conduct that they are abiding by, you could still have a good and decent society. 
But in this instance, where the homosexuality was coming into it and the lesbianism and uh, uh, things like that, I'm sure there was many more than that going on as well. Ultimately, it, it showed that there was no morality within the society. And again, an evil, wicked, and rotten society. And as God said, their sin was crying out to him. It grieved him. It hurt him. It gave him pain, as it were. And as a result, he, you know, the sin crying out, he wiped them out. He wiped out the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and the other three cities as well. So ultimately, this Ill illegitimate type of sex is man's distortion uh, and, uh, 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 of God's great plan and design. And it, what does it do? It destroys the castle walls of marriage that have been designed by God as well. And again, going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, I put verse 2 uh, up on here uh, again for you. But it says, but because of immoralities, again, every kind of unlawful sex, let, and then when we say unlawful, we say unlawful according to God's word, not according to the laws of your land, okay? That's relative morality. We go by absolute morality, God's word and God's principles that are found in the scriptures. It says, but because of immoralities, let each man have his own wife, and let each woman have her own husband. Let's also turn to uh, Romans chapter 1. And again, I've uh, been reading this uh, chapter to you time and time again. And again, when Paul wrote the book of Romans, he starts right off with this, you know, great litany of how the world has rejected their creator and therefore their savior as well. And he talks about the evil and wickedness that is throughout societies as a result of their rejection of their creator. And as it says in Romans chapter 1 and verses 24 through 27, it says, Therefore God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, that their bodies might be dishonored among them. Now, when it says God gave them over, it also you know, talks about handing them over or whatever the case may be. It doesn't mean that God made them do this stuff, okay? No, this is another way of saying God allowed them, okay? He wanted them to operate in holiness and righteousness, but because of the evil in their own heart and their rejection of him, ultimately he let them go off and be controlled by their own sin nature. All right, so it says in verse 25, For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature themselves rather than the Creator, who is God, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason God gave them over to degrading passions, for the women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. That's lesbianism or uh, in any form of, of sex outside of the marriage unit. Then in verse 27, And in the same way also the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desires towards one another, men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. So again, we see the homosexuality, we see lesbianism, we see these uh, perversions of God's uh, design for what sexual relationship uh, 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 could be and should be. And uh, therefore, as we so, uh, have noted, again, because of the days of Noah, it was perverted. He destroyed them. Because of the days of Lot, it was perverted. In Sodom and Gomorrah and the other cities, he destroyed them too. So what do we think is going to happen to the United States of America as we accept gay and homosexual marriages more and more each and every day and just make it part of our society. And the disgusting things are where they're teaching even kids that are in kindergarten and above in many schools today how to accept these things. It's okay. It's fine. It's wonderful. Okay. And there are many, many evils that are being perpetrated on our children in our school systems, our public school systems today that go totally against the word of God. And again, does that mean you pull your kids out of public school? Maybe, maybe not, okay? But what you do do is remember to teach your children because it's not up to the public education to teach your children the moralities of life and the Word of God. It's up to you. And so as a parent, you have that responsibility. And so they can go and hear those things, but you've got to make sure you clean it up on the back end. 
And don't be afraid to go to your school committee, your school boards, or whatever the case, and voice your opinion. There's nothing wrong with doing that in the Word of God. And you can go to them. And even if you're a grandparent or a great-grandparent, you can go to the school committees and the school systems if they're bringing that garbage into the school and speak your voice. Certainly the other side has spoke their voice and got their way. Why can't you? Fortunately, we still live in a free society. We'll see how much longer that goes on. But if we remain silent in some of these things, again, that ain't going to happen much longer. And again, we will not have the freedom of, 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 of our voice uh, that we currently richly enjoy. But then also, as we look at uh, Romans uh, uh, chapter 1 and verse 25, as it says, again, the reason they fall into the degradation is because they worshiped what? The creation rather than than the creator and again it's all about them and and they're more important and you know they don't have a creator they don't have a savior and they've totally thrown that off and they just want to live life according to want how they want to live life and ultimately what are they now doing living by their sin nature and satan's cosmic system and that's really what, what they're doing and so with that, because of the rampant worshiping of the creation rather than the creator, I wanted to share a little video with you this morning that's kind of interesting. And I kind of set this up for you uh, about a week or so ago. And uh, Bob Flint from upstate New York, uh, who listens to us online, uh, sent this uh, uh, down to me. And um, uh, it's similar to something uh, I've shown uh, years ago. But I just wanted to remind you of these facts. And then I'm going to come back and uh, give you what the, uh, the uh, 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 ultimately principle of all of this is. All right, so just sit back, watch the video. If you could turn this mic on too, Emily, that would be good. <laughs>
humbled now? <laughs> so the God who created that, we're the ones to say what is right and what is wrong? The God who has the a power and ability to create that, we're the ones to say that he's wrong and we're right? Again, how can anybody worship the creature and not understand their creator? And again, you just look at something small like that. And they say, oh, there's a big bang theory. Oh, there's a, well, who created the bang? Where'd the materials come from for the bang, okay? You see, in their theories and, 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 and their uh, <coughs> mindset, there is no beginning. And there is no end to it. But with us, we see a beginning. And we see a God who created the heavens and the earth. And we see a God who it loves us so much. And again, somebody who created all of that is someone who also sent his son to die on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins so that we could be with him for all of eternity. So again, when you just look at the enormity of our universe alone, how can you not believe that your God is the all-righteous, all-holy, all-just, and all-right God and not abide by his word? All right, let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for giving us an uh, uh, understanding of right relationship inside the marriage unit and help us to abide by that more and more each and every day, Father, as we uh, glorify you in our own personal relationships. And we thank you, Father, for giving us these great breath blessings to uh, uh, sh uh, share and enjoy the great intimacy and hope and love and grace that you have for us. And we can't thank you enough, Father. And so, Father, we ask that you be with the closing portions of our service this day in Christ's name. Amen. All right. So thank you very much for that portion of our service. And now we'll uh, partake of an offering. So I'll have Barry come forward. Pray for our. <laughs> How small it is. Yeah, what? Oh, then. Did it say up there, too? That. There are more atoms in one s grain of sand than all the stars in the universe. Like, like, and that's inside of us. It's like, uh. <laughs> okay, let us uh, pray for our offering. Lord, we pray that you bless this offering and all that we're able to give and continue to bless our congregation with gracious givers so that we may continue to meet our financial obligations in your word the truth continues to be taught from this pulpit. Through Christ we pray with the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.